bomb. Um, this is, uh, we're going to run until 11.25. Um, this is the, the first um, time, at least I'm aware of, that we've, we've had a bomb on this specific topic. Um, this is also the first talk of today's enterprise track. Um, so, throughout um, the red, or so, what I, I the basic premise of the bot that, that um, at least I was thinking about was that Debian has some really great technologies for dealing with um, a single system. You know, I can go with one command, get a variety of wiki sites or blogging systems um, or content management systems, a phone, a phone PBNs. Um, you know, a database of my choice, all on one system. Um, but the competition does a lot better at putting systems together. Um, sometimes we don't really focus a lot on, you know, Windows in this conference. Um, but I want to tell you a bit of a story um, about, it was, earlier this year was the first time I set up an Active Directory domain. Um, and um, basically, I was shocked at how simple it was. Effectively, with one command and clicking a few buttons, I was able to get to a point where I had, you know, a consistent corporate authentication infrastructure, directory, DNS system, um, all synchronized, um, and with basically a couple of button clicks, um, any machine in my organization could join that. And conceptually, I knew that, that you know, that was, that was the case. I've been, I worked on related software for, for years. Um, but I never actually gone through and looked at the user experience. We don't have anything like that that can take Debian, a single Debian system, and make it part of a group of Debian systems with that sort of level of ease of use um, and that sort of level of um, of integration, where basically we can have something kind of like packaging transcend one system and actually get to a, a group of systems. Um, but we do have a lot of, of the, the component technologies in Debian that are, that are used as part of these infrastructures. You know, things like um, Samba, LDAP, uh, Kerberos, Radius, um, you know, various printing and DNS infrastructure. We have all the components, but what we don't have is the integration. So I wanted to focus on, on three things. First of all, we do have some integration. Um, there are technologies like Puppet, Skep Engine, uh, you know, plenty of things, um, DevConf databases, uh, plenty of things I'm missing that are part of that, or that are, you know, that I, I'm not aware of, that are part of that integration puzzle. Um, and in particular, organizations where we've actually gotten to a point where we have that level of integration. Um, basically, it's, it tends to be custom within that organization, but it's taking advantage of all those, of, of those sorts of tools to build it. Um, the second thing is we have sub-projects, things like, you know, Debian and Get You, um, and various things that actually do seem to be within their target domain, um, putting together that level of organization. People have bet, built embedded Debian systems that have incredibly high levels of, work, of, of integration. Um, and finally, there's what can we do <coughs> better in the future? What are the areas where we can, uh, where we as packagers of enterprise and infrastructure software can, um, can get together and, and you know make the situation better. So I'd like to talk about um, you know tool. I, so, so the three topics I am aware of for this bot are um, you know what is the integration story like in our competition? Um, what is the integration? What are the tools and organization and success stories we have for how we can do uh, you know similar things within our software? And finally. Um, what should we be? What do we want to be doing next? What are our target priorities? How are we going to work on them? And so I propose to open this up as a discussion for for you know these sorts of time in a little bit myself, but but mostly what I, I think this will be productive is an actual um, back. We can, you know, uh, I don't know if we need to be passing mics around yet, um, but but if the video team does get things working, then we'll, we'll definitely want to do that. So 
thoughts? Anybody got any, has any thoughts? Uh, when, where are the, the audience time?
all of these solutions, as far as I'm aware, um, involve a fair amount of uh, work within your organization for you trying to decide what your turnkey installation can in include. Um, it's my impression that that work is more than the similar work to do group policy for AD. Um, although, getting group policy to deal with software installations that are not set up to work with group policy, it's my understanding, is tricky. I have not, I do not have much personal experience with that. I think that that problem of having, requiring a lot of work to work for your institution is kind of our biggest problem. They're, they're, Debian's very strong on the customization front. Um, and, you know, we, we certainly do a lot of that at Stanford where we have a bunch of configuration we apply on top of Debian to make everything work the way we expect it to do. It's more of a small site where you don't have somebody, I mean, Stanford was going to do that regardless. You know, you get turnkey installations are not going to work for us. We're going to have to do that kind of degree of customization. And most of the sites, I think, that have done a lot of work on Debian on the infrastructure in a similar boat, where there's a certain amount of, of, of uh, customization you're going to have to do no matter what. Either they do it on Windows, they do it on, on Linux, and you want all the tools available to build your own customization. Um, I think that what your, your introduction, you're kind of aiming more towards a somewhat different audience, which is the idea of, you know, we pull that directory out of the box, install it, uh, configure a Windows system to point at it, and it just works. No, no, because I, I, I think you, you, you need to, I, I'm, I want the minimum bar to be lower. Um, and I also, I want us to figure out, because basically our minimum bar for single systems is much lower, right? I mean, you can, we do a lot of customization of, of things within single systems. But the fact is I can, with very little effort, get started on within a, within a single system and pretty much any, you know, any class of software. Um, uh, you know, I basically just install it and, I, and within a couple of minutes I probably have something that I can start hacking, you know, start playing with. Um, and for integration, I think the minimum bar is a lot higher currently. And it's a lot higher on Linux than it is other places. It's, I mean, Mac OS kind of, kind of tried to tackle the same problem in terms of how you do a small worker solution fast right. with Kerberos and LDAP. Um, I think that there are mostly end up being examples of things I, I wouldn't want to do, actually. I, you know, I haven't looked at that kind of stuff. I got really, really complicated. But uh, I think that's kind of, that's where, I think that's the piece that's missing. You know, if you're, if you're a huge site, you have Puppet installed, yeah, you're yeah. installing custom configuration everywhere, that, there's a lot of tools to do that kind of thing. If you're on an individual box, there's a lot of tools to do that kind of thing. If you're doing something somewhat in between, there's a big gap. Right. And I guess I guess one question is, do we even want to solve that problem? Right? I mean, you know, are we willing to put manpower into that? Uh, I think another thing is that if you're using stuff like Kerberos, I mean, if you've been using it, you're already familiar with how to set it up, how to do it. You know, people who are looking at these solutions don't necessarily need that much handhold. And there are a lot of newer you know, technologies and you know, newer things that are necessarily not quite as legacy that you know, maybe more emerging technologies and look in that direction instead. I have an example of that you mentioned about uh, a case where a competitor has something that uh, is pretty interesting. And it was many years ago I found out about it. I remember learning that uh, um, Solaris had the ability that if you were running a Solaris site um, and you got some new hardware and you took it out of the box, you plugged in power, you plugged in Ethernet, you turned it on, um, and the machines were set up to automatically come up to HCP. Um, you know, some of these technologies aren't used as much anymore, but they would join the NIS domain, automatically set up the auto mounter and find all your, your NFS uh, file servers and um, and a bunch of other stuff. So basically your deployment was, you know, just turn the machine on and it's part of your structure. And that was something I always thought, man, you know, we need a way to do that in Debian so that um, all these services we already have set up, everything just gets automatically discovered. Yeah, I guess um, two things. Um, one, uh, I have a feeling that the companies that are doing the integration pretty well have probably gone through a pretty long phase of trial and error and um, and, and uh, development of management interfaces to be some kind of a common node. Um, uh, it, it might be a starting point to try to come up with 
um, for the different major applications that want to be integrated, what a, say, relational database schema for their configuration might be so that they could be put together and merged and, uh, and uh, you know, turned into something that people can deal with without having to know the specifics of the syntax and config of every individual piece. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, you mentioned uh, CMDB. Uh, CMDB really isn't very real at this point. It's mostly a marketing concept, and it's a very dumbed-down um, explanation of databases for um, administrators who really don't have the skill set to do it. Oh, I mean, CMDB is real in the sense that Stanford University tracks all of our servers through a CMDB um, and federates and using a CMDBF with a federated uh, CMDB data model. Uh, on the other hand, uh, certainly having gone through that experience, I would not have recommended it at this time to anybody else. Um, but it's one of the problems is how to use data models. Is, and I think it's one of the you know, more general problems. One of the things that Active Directory gives you is, is that you don't know that it's using Kerberos and you don't know that it's using LDAP. Um, it, you, you're just using Active Directory, you install it, and you can dig into that stuff if you want to, but it's kind of all uh, hidden behind an interface. Uh, which makes it a little easier to deal with. And you know, our experience is that with LDAP, you really want that uh, some degree of that information hiding until you're ready to dig into it and change things. Because uh, and it's kind of I think it's kind of unfortunate a little bit that all this stuff right now is built on LDAP. But I find LDAP really opaque in terms of trying to understand how its data models put together. It's really kind of strange if you come from a world of, of relational databases, and it. It doesn't. It, it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around, and that's. I think that's. It's like, how do, is there a better way of representing that data? Because right now, that's everyone who does this kind of integration, including Microsoft, when they want to plug all these pieces together, what they put in the middle is an LDAP server, and that's where all the data actually lives. And you know, I, it may be that we can't do any better right now, but there's. I think there's definitely pluses and minuses to that uh, technology and. I know at Stanford we put we've put a lot of effort into putting SQL databases in front of LDAP, and we don't put stuff in LDAP directly. We have middleware which does that for us, which is the only writer into LDAP, and all of the actual work happens in SQL databases. That's an interesting comment you just made. I just thought I'd say that, um, from my perspective, spend enough time with LDAP that now I don't find it too mystifying. And maybe that's just you know different strokes for different folks. Anything we do that uh, isn't LDAP is probably going to have to speak LDAP on some level, uh, at least for the you know near term. But that if you can at least get get halfway to actually understanding it, it shouldn't be that hard. I mean, one thing that I just wanted to say for a while is that we have the, all the pieces for most of this stuff. We just need to glue them together. That's that's an excellent segue, Carl. Um, uh, into two things. First of all, uh, can I get people who are speaking to uh, identify themselves, and, and preferably, if you're willing to disclose your organization, that would be useful. Um, secondly, um, how many packagers do we have in the room who are who are actually maintainers of, of software in this space, like? You, know, that you would view as, as sort of part of the pieces that, that Carl was talking about. I know I am, I know Russ are, but who else do we have? Um, about six, seven, maybe eight. Um, is there anything we as packagers should be doing to actually create that glue? Is, are there, um, you know, is, would, the, would there be more value in having coordination between the packages? Um, and, you know, do we want to try and um, work on that? Is, um, are there, there are action items we should pick up there? Or better communications or, or anything like that? CJ firmly, I, I've um, been involved in Debian since 95. Um, Linux Force is um, my Debian consultancy of sorts. Uh, the, this is a tough one. <laughs> uh, the, the, the data is, and, and you're talking en enterprise, and so things like Puppet and CF Engine make sense. But all my clients are distinct entities. Some of them are bigger, and maybe CF Engine or Puppet would make some sense for them. But a lot of them are small. And coming up with a solution that 
work that integrates both for larger scale organizations and uh, small business that might have two or three servers and you know, 10, 15 workstations. It's, I, I'm, I'm having difficulty imagining what the architecture should be that is flexible across those different size domains. Um, and, and if you had the architecture, uh, how would you interface with it? Is it, is it going to be web-based or GTK? And, you know, I, I've, the Debian Wiki has a great section on uh, control panels, which is one way. Every one of them uses a different architecture, different data model, some LDAP, some Postgres, or, you know, and every, everyone does it a different way. So, we, you know, there's a big policy question about the architecture, the data, and I don't even know where to begin to solve it. Does it, anyone have any? This is the beginning of a solution. I think it's just kind of a solution approach, which is, um, I forget whose law it was, it said that uh, the software tends to grow along organizational lines and reflect the nature of the organization that created it. So, um, you know, one thing uh, I've seen in a bunch of places that I've worked where I've heard the line, yeah, we've got all the pieces, we just need the glue to hook them all together, is that if you actually have a project that hooks them together specifically, you know, um, as the catalyst to hook them together, then that can actually drive the integration. Right, but... I mean, if we did, Debian had, a, had decided as an organization that they wanted to do something, that involved all that in some specific way, that involved blah, 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 and then this community participation in that, that would probably help. But I mean, right, I guess, but the, the, one of the key questions to me is, are any of the people who are actually, you know, working on the pieces interested in working on the code, willing to actually spend some time? And, and so far, I'm not really hearing a heck of a lot of and I mean, maybe this is just a problem we don't need to solve. Okay. Um, on the IRC, we have Andreas today asking whether um, anybody's thought about using the main list Debian Enterprise at LDO. Yeah. The lists uh, Debian Norman for discussing issues like this. I did not know that it existed. I didn't know it existed. Does it exist? Uh, apparently, Debian Enterprise, Debian Dash Enterprise main list does exist in Debian. So we have a I still think I don't know this. Um, I think this shows that we are not very organized, given that Russ and I probably should be on that mailing list. <laughs> I know I don't know that, right? But, but I mean, this, um, I mean that, that is kind of one of the interesting things is that, gosh, I wonder who else is out there. Uh, he says it's, it, it exists uh, for years, but, uh, but it's been unused. So I, I will mention with uh, on the front of LDAP in terms of practical things we can do at Debian um, is it, L, it, open LDAP is one of those chronically under maintained packages, um, and it you know that's that's a place where it could definitely use some some help and attention. Uh, there's some work that's going on right now in terms of getting um, C equals config back in uh, into uh, open LDAP, which basically means that your schema and whatnot is now stored directly in the, in the LDAP server instead of as a bunch of files on disk, which is the direction that upstream is taking things. Uh, and I know that the Debian EDU folks are using the LDAP uh, support in Debian pretty heavily, but uh, almost all of this stuff, like I mentioned earlier, almost all this stuff right now drives through LDAP, and the LDAP packages in Debian are not in great shape. Uh, and they're not in horrible shape because you know uh, one person's been doing a lot of work on them, but they definitely could use more than one person working on them. Particularly given that we have uh, an annoying OpenSSL versus GNU TLS issue um, with those packages, and upstream really really hates GNU TLS, so we, we end up having to do bear most of the burden in terms of SSL debugging. Drake Diedrich at uh, Google, but I wanted to comment on Debathena. The uh, primary way Debathena deploys their configuration to all the different clients is by building configuration packages. I worked with uh, one of the developers in Debathena, had to come across and do an internship, and some of the uh, 
some of the things that we were doing internally are out on wiki.debian.org in the config packages directory. And they have a, uh, a system uploaded of config packages dev that allows you to build your own custom configuration packages locally. That, that um, I've, um, I, I will strongly encourage people to take a look at that. Um, it's a very interesting concept. Um, basically, the idea is that, uh, is that in many ways, some package probably doesn't provide the configuration knobs you need. Um, and it's a way for you and your organization to um, help the package's configuration along in a way that's going to work well with upgrades. Um, and I found that in, uh, prior to the development of that work, I kept, uh, I, I was not involved in the, in the um, development of config package dev, um, but I have, in multiple instances, had to reinvent that work before it existed. And so it's, it's something, the design pattern, I think several Debian packagers who, who are making this uh, organization local changes have found themselves in. I mean, there's a whole lot of logic in the curve 5 config um, package, for example, to try to build a curve 5comp for you. Um, that it, basically, I think that package is a great example of a package that's solving one specific problem in a way in which should be a more, there should be a more general framework available to do what it's doing, and there just isn't right now. Um, there actually was discussion. I know last year's DevConf, um, when I was doing updates to curve 5 config, Someone pointed me in a framework that seemed, it didn't seem far enough along that I wanted to depend on it for curve 5 config, um, but I think there is an attempt at something like that. Unfortunately, I don't remember what it was called. Uh, config model is one that I've seen floated around. Yes, that was okay, that's it. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a discussion that's happened from time to time on Debian Devel um, about config model, which is a, a Perl framework for modeling configuration file languages and the idea is, is that um, you should be able to use that to um, you should be able to, you should be able to use that to uh, um, basically describe a configuration file because everybody uses a different configuration file format and then use it to programmatically manipulate that configuration file um, and ideally you would want to be able to expose all that behavior to Debian package maintainer scripts so then you can do upgrades in a much saner fashion. I mean, I, I'm sure that I'm not the only person who has Debian packages who, where my maintainer scripts during upgrades do these horrible grab said odd things to try to fix uh, configuration parameters that have changed. Jeff Crompton from Trinity College. Um, does config model have any similarity to Orgis, which I've seen the public mentioning and I've never used? Uh, I believe, as is often the case with these kinds of things, config model and Agis are essentially the same thing, uh, except that one of them was written by Ruby people and one of them was written by Perl people. <laughs> um, but I think they're very similar sorts of ideas, yeah. Uh, and I know the public being a Ruby community thing, mostly, uh, is, has Agis support built into it and can manipulate configuration files that way. Um, and that kind of seems to be the direction that Puppet is trying to move in for solving that similar sort of problem. Uh, one of the, I mean, I, we love Puppet, and we're going to talk about Puppet in the next boss, um, but I don't know if Puppet scales down uh, all that horribly well. I know that we would not have put the effort that we put into rolling Puppet out if we had, you know, 50 machines. It, it, at, at, at 200, 300, it's great, but, uh, and above, but um, it, it you're, you're, you're buying into a whole configuration management framework, and that's one of the things that makes the uh, configuration packages interesting, because then you're just sort of reusing Debian facilities, and you don't, that scales down a little bit better. Um, but there's various things in policy and in the way that Debian packages work that you run into some trouble when you start trying to manage configuration files in Debian packages that are not the same package as the software that you're configuring. Um, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of config package dev, is it comes up with a reasonable, it, it is not a policy compliant solution. You could not upload the result of config, of, of the config package to the archive. Um, but organizations aren't required to follow policy. Um, and what config package dev, dev is, it, it tries to solve the practical problems. Um, but obviously it is possible for the underlying package to change in such a way that it becomes out of sync with your config package. 
we got about five minutes yeah. left. So I'd like to make, I guess, a couple more comments and then see if we can wrap this up and, and, and figure out. Um, this is Matt Tiger. I work for Ryzen Networks. We can also go a little longer if we want to cut into the public off as well. Um, so we're always going to need the ability to manipulate these weird existing configuration files. But one thing I've kind of liked recently that Debian has done a lot of is has been uh, pushing to move to kind of the .d directory idea where you, you drop in config file snippets. And I really like that model a lot because it makes it easy for the package to deliver things, but it makes it easy for end users to drop things in there as well. And so, you know, to what extent should we really be trying to convince upstreams that they should use um, a model that's uh, allows for that as opposed to um, trying to work around these weird config files. I don't know if anybody has any comments on that. Hey, we convinced Kerberos. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I think a lot of us are happy about that. Um, but, uh, one idea that's occurred to me many times, but I've done absolutely nothing about it, uh, was that it would be really nice if uh, you could do something like update on install controlling the machine that you're on, waiting for you to add the second machine. So, you know, make it so that you have an enterprise-wide control system controlling the one machine you own from the start, and then adding the second machine is trivial, rather than waiting until you have 200 machines <coughs> all configured differently, and then you to save yourself from the nightmare. So but does anyone want to work on that at Dead Camp next year? I mean, seriously, like, like, take take a good idea like that. Get three or four people to say, actually, yes, I'm willing to come and work on that on a specific period of time, and that's how you like actually do it. Well, I've been demonstrating my utter incompetence of getting around to it for about five years. So. <laughs> sure, but I mean, you know, you, you, some other people want to beat me up. Well, yeah, I, I come to Dead Camp and end up sticking cabinet over the walls. So. Right, now, so I, I understand you're busy at Dead Camp, but I mean, you've done step one, which is tell other people your idea. Yeah, that's how I do get most things done these days. I drink your drink again. I wanted to make another comment about the um, configuration packages and the packages they are configuring. The two worst things to configure are LDAP and Kerberos because of all the logic that's already in the existing packages. I have this table in that uh, wiki page discussing several different things you have to do to work around and wedge other packages so that they stop updating the configuration files since you've already taken them over. The best solution is hierarchical. And I live with the dot e directories where you just create a new file somewhere else and that takes over and, and that configures your system. A lot of them can be taken over with e package divert, even though it's not policy compliant. You can do it once and you can make it work for a lot of systems. Some of them you have to wedge something into DevConf in order to make the DevConf script not run, and others are even harder to get rid of. One of them I had to use on a bind mount in order to wedge the system to keep it from destroying configuration files. So simple is better. Um. Certainly, I would be interested in cases uh, if you if there are cases where um, the for Kerberos where where it uh, is overriding changes you've made um, that's a bug. I can't promise to be able to fix it, um, but it's supposed to be very good about noticing what you've done and not screwing with it. Um, if, so let's take it offline. If there are bugs in Kerberos, can fix this file. Um, so, just just sort of some concluding remarks. Um, we've had sort of a you know a discussions ranged around a couple of things. I think if we're going to do this in the future, we should coordinate on the enterprise list, have some specific topics and some specific proposals to discuss to be make a more effective use of time. Um, thank you for your um, your interest. I hope we all join the enterprise list and, and create a vibrant community.